Now, Global Voice with active interest in India, Jonathan Shijal. He's Chief Investment Officer at Ashburton Investments. Joins us right now in our studios. Jonathan, good having you. Thanks so much for taking the time out. Um, what's what's the view uh, for the global markets at large and India at, in individually as well? The last 20, 25 odd trading sessions or the last one month has been positive despite the fact that the macro cues and the macro indicators, the bond deals, the currency, etc., are not going in the same way as bulls would like them to. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think um, globally, clearly, that you know the volatility certainly has been increasing. Eyes are focusing on U.S. interest rates. Obviously, the three, the ten-year yield um, around that three percent mark, and obviously the dollar. So, so that's providing a, a little bit of concern in some quarters. I think emerging markets have been an area where global investors have been investing for some time. Uh, India, if I'm honest, is, is, is an area which I think isn't of huge interest at the moment to most global investors. Foreign investors actually, they're waiting in India, in, in, in India is probably five or six year low. Uh, most foreign investors are probably looking a little bit more to China and some of the other commodity um, type plays than India today. Well, why would that be the case, Jonathan? I mean, so one, it is evident by virtue of the last two months flows that FIs have, if anything, been pulling money mm. out of India, both the debt markets and the equity markets. I mean, are people waiting for valuations to correct? Are people waiting for the macros and India-specific macros to improve? What's the, I mean, what's, what's the trigger that could change this? So I think it's two things. I think you're quite right. You know, clearly, valuation has been a concern. It remains a concern. It's, it's something I often hear over the last two or three years. Mm. Um, that, obviously, we need to see earnings to, to deal with that. And obviously, that hasn't come through. So I think most investors They've heard this sort of jam tomorrow story. You know, the economy is going to start improving again. Um, you know, the investment cycle will, will start kicking off again. But the, the fact is, we haven't yet seen concrete evidence of it. Now, right, we haven't got disruptions now like we've had over the last couple of years, potentially. So it should start coming through. But I think people want to see evidence before they actually probably head back into India. So is it valuations and earnings or the concerns which we've been highlighting for the likes of rupee depreciation, the crude oil prices which have been inching higher, that does not augur well at all for Indian economy? I think you're right, but, but you know, in, in my conversations with investors, um, I think if you look back, say, to the taper tantrum, you, you go back okay. a few years back, and you look at the macro situation of India then to, mm. to, to today, and actually uh, some of these other vulnerable emerging economies, I think a lot of the excesses have been worn out. So I agree, at, at the margin, the macro certainly has got worse in India. Um, so the concerns now previously, the macro was great here a little, a little while back, but the, the, bottom, the right. bottom up story wasn't so good. Hmm. Now as the bottom up story hopefully starts improving, the top down story has got a little bit worse. So. It's, it's a bit of a mixture. Really. Okay, you know what, these are the primary concerns mm. which everybody's been highlighting, but there were few developments which took place, for example, LTCG being imposed post the budget, and uh, obviously the ex Indian exchanges said that we're not going to share data with the global mm. exchanges. Do you think these factors have also led to cut down of passive investing which was taking place in India through ETFs or any other route? Potentially. Um, I, I'm not so concerned about foreign investors because mm -hmm. the, the reality is they haven't really been buying this market for two or three years. So it's not like everybody's overweight. Most people we speak to, you know, they, they might be marginally overweight. Okay. But they used to be very overweight. Um, and, and so I think actually, in, you know, that there is potential for foreign money to come back into this country, but probably in the second half of the year. But yeah, at the moment, um, there are factors everybody's worrying about, but they're not really new. It's an interesting assortment of holdings that you have. Uh, we've called it out, of course, of the terminal, I believe. But uh, you're present uh, across a wide spectrum uh, from financials, wherein HDFC is your top weightage, to having Infosys and HCL Tech. And certainly seems to be the case that you are betting on technology fairly favorably amongst your other uh, holdings in India. Yeah, I think so for us, w when we think about constructing a portfolio, having a balance I I is very important. Um, and certainly from a rupee perspective, we do like to have natural hedges. It is very expensive for us. We, you know, we're always thinking about foreign investors who, who, who are coming into this market and clearly the call on the rupee is a very big one for them. Mm. So naturally, we tend to have some exporter exposure in there to, to naturally hedge that, that, that risk, if you like. Um, we are a quite underweight technology, actually, but yeah, we do have a couple of big holdings. Well, you're underweight technology. Net, net, yeah. you're underweight. Yeah, we've only got two obviously stocks. It's it's a reason. It's, you know, tech has done reasonably well over the last six months. Yes. Um, so why are you underweight? Um, it's yeah. 
we went in a little bit early, shall we say. We, we, we've been in, in, in the space for some time. It was looking great value, you know, six to eight months. We were, we were upping our weight then. Okay. Uh, pretend, yeah, we've been looking at one or two counters mm -hmm. to add into, and they just haven't come back down to the valuation point we've been. But uh, do you think the valuations have run up too much now at current levels? Uh, they, they've certainly done well. Um, I think, you know, whether we're a screaming buy from a valuation perspective six to, you know, to 12 months ago, um, I think now, obviously, we need to see earnings coming through. You know, you haven't got that, that, that valuation comfort behind you anymore. But I think compared to other pockets of the market, they, they still look quite attractive. Some of uh, the bets that you guys have taken, and then we will want to talk a bit about uh, the global macro as well, Jonathan. But some of the bets that you guys are taking in India seems to suggest that you are doing a lot of bottom-up uh, uh, analysis before you're buying as well. It is not necessarily just a top-down call. A clutch of names out here are names that not too many institutional investors generally um, have or global investors have in the portfolio. No, absolutely. I, I think, you know, it's interesting if you look at the market the last few years, um, it's gone, for, you know, the last couple of years have been very bottom up. Um, I think we're actually moving back into more of a top down phase where we, the macro call, the sector call is going to be incredibly important. Um, and we haven't had that for a few years in India. That said, absolutely, you know, there's so many exciting companies here that, you know, we look to invest in. Um, it would be a shame just to stick to the top 10, 20 you know, stocks that, that are here that are very well covered, very well understood and, and researched. Um, we find so many opportunities across the spectrum, across the market cap spectrum that, that uh, certainly we're, you know, we're very keen to invest in. But if you're moving back to a top-down approach in a meaningful way, would that mean that you would look to uh, pull some money out of India? I mean, that certainly seems to be uh, the sense that I'm getting from this conversation. Global investors not completely positive, valuations looking expensive earnings might come back, haven't still come back as yet in full strength. Am I to assume that you are looking to trim down your India positions? Not really. Um, I mean, as a house, we've been overweight India all the way through. It's, it, it's been a, a good call. I think we try and be a little bit more long term. This is a phenomenal market for long term investing to get that sort of compounding return that sure. the market does offer you. But of course, there will be periods where the market will underperform. We've been going through one of those for the last, you know, certainly year to date. When you look at India versus other emerging markets, there, there has been quite a significant underperformance there. But that's, you know, anybody who's, who's, who's just, you know, looking slightly longer than two minutes, it, it, it's fine. You know, that's, that's just the reality. And, you know, we're, we're quite happy to see the volatility coming back um, because some stocks, particularly in the mid cap space, when the volatility comes back, that's when more steady hands can actually look to acquire. So do you expect a healthy correction or consolidation this year? I think we've had one. Um, obviously we've the recovered from there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, it's amazing sentiment domestically, certainly, you know, when I was speaking to people here, was gotten very negative. Um, I, I was probably more hoping for a second half recovery. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's when, when the stars will be slightly more aligned. Obviously, there is volatility that could come through from the political calendar, certainly sure. in the next you know, month or two. But yeah, I, I don't see a reason for the market to roar away at the moment. Right. Um, I think we do need more evidence of, of that earnings recovery. So if you expect through. some sort of recovery to come in in the second half, which are the sectors where you expect some green shoots to come back? So I think you know the, the more broadening out that we're seeing of the investment recovery, certainly in certain sectors, um, we, we are um, invested into some industrial spaces. Um, we haven't got any of the retail banks, which obviously um, with, with Kotex numbers that, that, that look good. But you know we, we, we've been trying to. Um, put money back to work into sectors which aren't quite so overvalued um, as some of us, for example, the, the structural plays in the consumer space are looking quite expensive. The staple stocks are looking very expensive as well. Um, but there's plenty of other areas in consumption that's, that still look okay and quite frankly it's more economically sensitive stocks as well um, where we see stocks which have got some operational leverage to a recovery. Interesting. Um, before I get to that point, uh, you, your, your answer brought me to looking at your holdings. You don't have a bank in your top 10 holdings. Forget consumer facing, save for an NBFC. I don't think you have a bank in your top 10 holdings. No, that's quite right. Wow. So why, I mean, ha have you trimmed positions there or have you not gotten a chance to enter? Are you looking to enter? I mean, what's the scenario here? I mean, 35% so of the weightage and you don't absolutely. have a presence there almost. We, we do own three banks, but, but we, they're not particularly large holdings in right. them. Um, we did actually reduce our weighting um, about a month ago. Okay. Um, ICICI Bank? Absolutely. 
uh, before I can that. see that featuring on number 13, so I guess that. <laughs> that's, that, yeah, that, that's, that, that's one we, we, we took out. I just think in the short term there was risk of that whole thing sort of exploding out again and obviously with the PMB story still rumbling on, uh, we felt uh, we were overweight corporate banks. We just reduced that a little bit for the short term. Okay, and, and you, uh, okay, and, the, and the part two of your answer, earlier answer was you're looking at uh, the playing the story of uh, the corporate util uh, the co capacity utilization theme or the leverage theme moving up as well. How are you playing that? And uh, uh, Jonathan, I, I don't know what other markets do you look at, but looking at the other EM pack, I, I know investors might be preferring a lot of other pockets but India. If you do look at a lot of other EM markets as well and then compare India versus the EM markets, to your mind, where does India stand? Well, obviously, in valuation, it's, it's, it's top of the pack. Um, but I, you know, we often tell investors it always is, and there's a very good reason. There's a number of reasons for that. I mean, first of all, I think where India really does stand out is the quality of the corporates. Uh, sure, not all corporates are brilliant quality, but the point is, we can find as a pack enough corporates that are, you know, incredibly well-run management teams mm. with a huge opportunity that India offers, um, mm. and that's the reason for the value, but the basic reason. You, you, and then on top of that. You've got the regulatory regime, the governance side, which India clearly has, and quite frankly, the concept of the shareholder. Um, some of these other emerging markets, they're fairly new. Stock markets are fairly new, uh, particularly companies, they're countries that have come out of communism more recently. And that takes a long time to embed the concept of the shareholder. So that's another advantage India certainly does. Again, not all companies particularly pay much attention to it, but most do, and, and I think that's you know, one of the reasons why India stacks up so well, and, and international investors do see that. When you look at the compounding returns that you know, investors have had in India over the last 10, 20 years, there isn't, quite frankly, another emerging market which has matched that. So then the question is, is it all over? Is, is the good times behind us? And I think, actually, when you look at the reforms that, that have happened, the impact of those reforms haven't really come through yet. So for us, the good times are still ahead. Um, you know, the informal to the formal economy, which right. is, you know, certainly shifting slowly, um, provides a lot of opportunities how for the large, listed space. How large would your Indian investment be, Jonathan, if you are at a liberty to say that? So, if, if I look at our multi, our equity um, investments as a propor proportion of our equity, we're probably at about eight or nine percent. And what features on the top among the emerging markets? I'm asking. So, primarily, we're mainly focused on the Asian emerging markets. Okay. So we have traditionally ma ma mainly pitched into China, India, and occasionally some of the other smaller ones. Um, we, d we do have it, have it from time to time also played s some of the commodity producing uh, players outside of uh, Asia, Brazil for example. But there are different issues you face when you invest in some of those economies. Since you mentioned about commodity driven economies, I just want to take your view on the metal space which mm. has been in focus because of the trade war issues and I do see something like Hindalco featuring among your top three holdings. Uh, so the rally that one has seen uh, you know, for the metal stocks in the last one year, do you expect that to continue? I think if we were to push away the political issues okay. emanating out of the US which obviously provides a bit of uncertainty on the sector, I think if you look at most of the commodity spaces you saw, um, you know, after the rise of China and the impact that China had on the commodity spaces, and then obviously the bust that happened a few years back when commodity prices collapsed. And I think most of the commodity um, countries and companies have readjusted um, to the new reality of the world today. Um, and so actually, it's been interesting as we've seen commodity prices rise, what you haven't seen is a commensurate sort of rise in output yet. So they seem to be the discipline of commodity companies seems to be holding. Um, and, and also you combine that with the actual users of commodities like steel and, and, and aluminium, you're not seeing this massive increase in production globally. You're, you're, you know, the reality is, particularly in China, we're seeing consolidation, we're seeing rationalization. And actually we are finally genuinely seeing that where I think we've talked about it a lot over the last decade or so. So I think the view for us would be we're still quite positive on the space, uh, but in the short term, Clearly, there's some volatility through politics, unfortunately. <laughs> What's the earning growth you're expecting for FI19? For the market as a whole, I mean, mm -hmm. it's obviously adjusting. I think our last numbers, we were in about um, 17 or 18 percent. 
Okay. So That's slightly right. probably below consensus. Yeah, the consensus is somewhere 22 to 23 mm. percent. <laughs> okay, Jonathan, uh, one final question from my end. Uh, what's the big event that you're watching out for? From an Indian perspective, would it be the Indian elections or do you believe uh, the global banking moves, uh, if at all there is further tightening and the resultant impact on EMs at large, would be a bigger draw? I think a bit of both, if I'm honest. Um, yeah, I mean, yes, I, I but that's the easy answer. Absolutely. <laughs> um, I think clearly global investors are very concerned about what's happening with the dollar. And, and then that will have ramifications for the whole EM space. You know, there's no doubt about that. And clearly with US interest rates, obviously, and cost of capital and, and all those issues. Um, that, that is, I think, going to be uh, fixating most global investors' minds, um, certainly for some time ahead. And also, interestingly, the leadership change potentially in the equity space as well. The FANG stocks, the, the, those stocks which have led the market up over the last couple of years, not all of them, but certainly some of them seem to be facing a bit of pressure, break-up calls, et cetera, et cetera. So the leadership is also changing, which is always a bit causing yeah. a bit of disruption as well. Um, I mean, from an Indian perspective, I think clearly the politics is, is, is going to be a worry at people's you know, minds. We've got a year or so to go before the election with a few local elections or state elections to come up, which will provide volatility. To us, it's just volatility. Um, I think sentiment's clearly a bit negative already on India, mm. which we find that quite positive. Positioning is not... So are you using that sentiment as an opportunity to buy anything around the current valuations? Um, no, definitely. You know, we, we've been, we're definitely looking at quite a few counters to pick up. Obviously, the market's pushed back up again, um, okay. but we're certainly you know, looking to use volatility to, to get positions. We, you know, we got a position a couple of months, a month, month or so back in that we've been tracking for a long time that, that had come down. Um, so, yeah, we're definitely using that volatility. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Jonathan, great having you. Thank you so much for taking the time out and being with us today. Look forward to having you more often on this floor. Thank you.